Right now, these old CCC barracks aren't in any shape to house young people overnight, but that's about to change. The U.S. Forest Service recently received one and a half million dollars to complete weatherization and other renovations at Rabidou. The building will stay intact pretty much as we see it, and trying to save it the best we can. Rabideau itself was built in 1935. Uh, there was originally a CCC company uh, from Missouri that came up here and built the camp. Uh, and apparently they didn't like the cold very much. We had pretty cold winters. Uh, so they were sent, uh, reassigned to California. And uh, meantime, uh, there was a company of CCC men um, that were stationed at Lake, the Lake Winnebagosh's camp and they were transferred to Rabidou and that became Company 708 um, which was the, uh, the company that was there until the camp closed in 1941. Um, the, as I said, the, the CCC folks did a lot of different projects on the forest. They were just, there were 23 camps on the Chippewa National Forest not all of them were operating at, at the same time. And actually, uh, three of them also became prisoner of war camps after the, uh, the, the World War II started. Because these CCC camps were never intended to be permanent, they, most of them were dismantled, they were torn down, burned, in some cases uh, so removed and sold. Um, and there just are very few, uh, only scattered buildings here and there. Uh, but because this camp was maintained uh, and put to use, it was, uh, it was basically saved from the wrecking ball. The whole idea of creating innovative programs for youth started in 2005. That's when a group of people on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation got together to find solutions to a wave of crime and violence that had swept the region. Rabidou coordinator Dan Evans says the effort was born out of tragedy. At that time, you know, that's when they had the Red Lake shooting. They had five or six homicides uh, on, on the reservation, Leech Lake Reservation. And there, it was a different, different world in 2005 than it is nowadays. Those early meetings resulted in partnerships between the tribe, government agencies, school districts, and nonprofits. Several foundations provided more than $100,000 to develop a strategy. At the same time, the U.S. Forest Service was looking for new uses for the old Civilian Conservation Corps buildings at Camp Rabidou. Randy Finn is deputy director of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. He's also chairman of the newly formed nonprofit Rabidou Conservation Academy and Learning Center. Finn says it's all a work in progress, but the dream is to turn Rabidou back into the sort of place it was during the Great Depression, a place where young people learn to work hard and gain new skills. I see it as being a base for maybe a Job Corps, a AmeriCorps. Um, I see it as being a base for uh, maybe Minnesota Conservation Corps programs, our own language immersion for the uh, tribal uh, people. I see it as, as an outdoor learning center and perhaps even at some point in time having it uh, being a, almost an alternative learning center, almost as a charter type school. Right now, these old CCC barracks aren't in any shape to house young people overnight, but that's about to change. The U.S. Forest Service recently received one and a half million dollars to complete weatherization and other renovations at Rabidou. That's good news for Mary Nip. She's a historian for the U.S. Forest Service. Nip's grandfather was a CCC worker in the 1930s, and she thinks he might have worked at this very camp. Nip says it's exciting to see Rabidou come to life again after so many idle years. Kind of like watching a cocoon open up and a butterfly emerging. We're not quite opened completely yet, or have, we're not flying yet, let's say that. But it's getting there, and that's and, and see kids here again. You know, it's been silent for so long. This is a 112-acre site, and it's just beautiful. 
and it's uh, classified and listed as a national landmark as the best preserved conservation, civilian conservation corps in the United States. And there's not very many of those, less than 2,500 uh, uh, landmarks. And in order to be a landmark, you have to be a significant part of the United States history. We're doing a Lady Slipper survey project along the scenic highway out here. Um, which is scheduled to start reconstruction next year or 2010 and there's about 10,000 lady slippers up and down the highway and a lot of those are going to um, be casualties when they do the reconstruction so we're marking where those are going to be so we can relocate them so that's the kind of service learning and conservation projects we're trying to do. We're in the process of restoring the original buildings back to their back to their original shape and putting new foundation and subflooring underneath them at this time. This is approximately a week's worth of work that's been done so far with the moving of the, removing the building and taking the old flooring out. A little bit, we're doing some bracing, we're putting new flooring in and then some rebracing some of the old, the existing that is damaged and rotted. So you're not tearing up the whole building, you're just no, like... No, the building will stay own. intact pretty much as we see it. And okay. Trying to save it the best we can. It wasn't really too bad for us on the farm. We had always had plenty to eat and seemed to be no trouble getting clothes and, and of course there weren't as many expenses. We didn't have, of course we didn't have the technical entertainment to do nowadays. No. <laughs> but I don't think anybody did no, it. No, no. Yeah. I've heard that before that those who were on the farm really didn't have it. It never really bothered us. It probably bothered my father more because there was taxes to pay and, and so on and cash money was really hard to find. And I suppose just the idea of it, taking care of his family, that was a big yeah, family right. to yeah. take care of. Yeah. Did your mother then do a lot of cooking and, or canning? And oh yes, she canned lots of vegetables and we picked lots of fruit and fall we had to pick wild raspberries and, and blueberries. So we she, did that and it wasn't the depression. But she, can about a hundred quarts of fruit every year. Mm -hmm. Handy in the winter though, isn't it? Oh yeah, we have all the food. How about meat? How did you keep your meat from? In the winter we had a, a box lined with metal mm -hmm. so the rodents couldn't chew in and just set it outdoors in the shade. We kept our meat you that keep way. snow around it or yeah, anything? Yeah, so it'd be cold. It's kind of the way we did. We had My dad was the last ice man in Bemidji so oh. we didn't get a fridge till everybody else had one. Uh, no, we never even had ice. We lived on the Mississippi River. We we're a long ways from any lake, so it was oh. hard to get the river water was a little too muddy. Yeah, we didn't so. like the ice. Yeah. They had a special crew that worked most of the year just cutting firewood. I have some pictures in that book that show the wood piles. They're just huge. Well, I'm sure with the cook fire and all the all can buildings. buildings had to be heated. Yeah, we had six barracks and there was three stoves in each barracks. And then all the rest of the buildings, the hospital building and power plant and the yes. office and the officers' quarters and dining room. Yeah, there's quite a few different and places. A lot of stores, a lot of stores. The buildings at Rabidou were actually prefabricated. Uh, they were built in sections that were bolted together after they arrived here on a train. And then they were modified as needed by uh, carpenters and CCC enrollees. And one of the biggest problems we have with the preservation out there is that they basically have no foundations under them. It's a, it's a wonder that they've survived the, the difficult Minnesota winters with the, the freezing and thawing uh, over so many years. A lot of the buildings uh, are twisted and racked uh, because of all the, the freezing and thawing uh, and the movement. They, they basically have no foundations under them. Uh, most cases, they uh, they simply were uh, built on piers that were dug into the ground, and uh, one of our objectives, primary objectives out there with the restoration, is to uh, is to pick those buildings up and put a foundation underneath them. And we've done that with several buildings now, um, and of course, then we repair the roof and, and uh, restore the interiors into apartments uh, and, and other things, apartments and offices. 
And so we try and restore that back to the original condition. Uh, we've used the Passport and Time program a few, years to, uh, for you, a few years ago to restore the education building, which was the building that was used as a classroom. Uh, and um, we uh, had volunteers from that program uh, come and do all kinds of carpentry and uh, endless painting. Uh, and uh, also volunteers from Minnesota Conservation Corps uh, and and other programs locally here. So there's been a lot of a uh, lot of effort put into restoration of those buildings, and we have a couple more in progress now. And, and hopefully next year we'll also be able to to put the finishing touches on uh, the recreation building and and other officers' quarters out there. One of the ways that we would like to uh, preserve the camp is to find another occupant under special use permit to use the camp and um, it, it's it's very expensive as you might imagine to uh, restore and maintain all those buildings out there and it's kind of silly to have empty buildings sitting out in the woods so what we'd like to do is uh, get uh, a, 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 a tenant on, out there to uh, provide some programs that benefit the local community and we've been talking to a consortium of organizations uh, that include the uh, the tribal college the uh, the reservations here the uh, uh, the boys and girls clubs here uh, the Minnesota Conservation Corps and a number of other organizations that are interested in providing some training classes we have uh, uh, we are working with them to set up a, a conservation academy and, and, and learning center out there uh, to provide training opportunities for uh, young folks, um, probably two age groups, the, the, the uh, younger kids and, uh, and the older teenagers, to um, either go out as a, a day camp sort of a thing for the youngsters or uh, an overnight camp for the older kids and provide learning opportunities for them so that they can uh, develop some skills and, um, and interests and uh, provide them with uh, the resources that they need to pursue a career of some kind. Uh, so we're hoping that that will uh, Pan out in the next couple of years, and that uh, we'll get an occupant in there who can uh, not only maintain the historic buildings, but but uh, probably add some additional facilities that meet their needs. Uh, and um, that camp will be preserved for many years. I'm from Bedet, Minnesota, and you stayed at this camp. You worked here for 22 months. I lied my age to get in <laughs> and so I, I'm a year off but uh, I got caught with a car so they discharged me. So I didn't get my two years out of the deal. Uh, but we had we had a good we had a good we had a good a good 22 we we had a, a wonderful camp. Tell me about the buildings behind you. Is that where you stayed? That was our that was section six. See, the university changed everything around. What was the toughest job you had in camp? Well, <clears throat> really, I. Never did have any. We worked hard, but work to work hard was the name of the game. Did those you have, days? Did you have any adverse conditions like cold, bugs? No, we had. We had in uh, that very in the. There's a picture in that building there. Uh, this building where there's about that much ice on the wall, on the south side. But we never were cold. We had wood. We had two big stoves in each, in each barracks, one on each end, you know. And uh, and a night guard went through once every hour. 
so the fire was always going and that uh, there was a lot of them that figured there was hardships but it really wasn't was when you came out left here were then were you drafted in World War two no I didn't get drafted until I didn't get da drafted until the armistice day and I'll tell you how that happened uh, or the reason I'm telling it to you. I was listening, I turned the TV on one afternoon and there was a commentator that asked the question three times. Do you know exactly what you were doing when the armistice was signed? And they, they asked it again. And a third time he put some real affirmative. He says exactly what you were doing. And I was down in, the, in Fort Snelling there was 250 of us bare, naked. We were getting our shots and we were headed across. And when we, when that came over the intercom, they just dropped us, turned around, hauled us back home. As we move forward with this into into this, it's it's good to look back and see something that that saved young lives back in the 30s, having that same impact in in the 21st century. And as we move forward. I think this camp is going to have not only a, a regional impact, but, a, but it'll also gather some of the national spotlight on the things you can do, uh, taking old concepts and making them new again, and working toward making, making young lives more productive, giving opportunity to where there is none, and giving everybody a chance to, to um, really commit to youth commit to education, commit to that transition to adulthood, which seems to be so hard for so many young people in today's world. And sometimes going backwards and, and taking the things that we had in history and making them new again has the biggest impact. And Rabidou also does something else, which is it takes a lot of these kids from, from the couch out into the woods. It takes them... Uh, from being being uh, nature deprived to being nature enriched, and it gives them an opportunity to enjoy what all of us take for granted, which is a great environment and uh, love and understanding of the great outdoors and the conservation and working in that environment to make it a better place. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Camp Rabidou and how it uh, how it came to be. Um, back after the, uh, during the Great Depression, President Roosevelt established the uh, CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, in 1933. And it was a package of what was called the, the New Deal, a number of organizations and programs that were created to help bring the country out of the Great Depression. Uh, the CCC was intended to, um, to help train young men and um, give them uh, give their families a little help as well. Uh, they were enrolled into the CCC and uh, they were paid about $30, uh, 25 of which had to go back home to their families. And uh, they did all kinds of uh, work on the forest. Uh, there were not just National Forest CCC camps but also state, uh, state camps and uh, and I believe the Park Service also, National Park Service had some camps as well. Uh, and they are really responsible for most of the infrastructure that we have on the Chippewa National Forest now. Uh, they did just a tremendous amount of work. Uh, was a great labor force, source of uh, um, labor. And of course it benefited the young men by teaching them uh, different skills and trades. They also had um, educational programs for them. A lot of them had completed uh, high school and, and that kind of thing and, and uh, had to go to work because their families were poor. So a lot of them didn't have a, very much of an education. So that was the purpose of the program was to try and um, garner the, uh, the human resources to take care of the natural resources as well. That was the philosophy of the program. Because these CCC camps were never intended to be permanent they, most of them were dismantled, they were torn down, burned, in some cases uh, so removed and sold, 
Um, and there are just our very few uh, only scattered buildings here and there. Uh, but because this camp was maintained uh, and put to use, it was, uh, it was basically saved from the wrecking ball. The, uh, the significance of the, the CCC camp is that uh, you know, it, it represents uh, a period in the history of this country that was uh, really pivotal in, in terms of its economic and social development. The CCC contributed a great deal to not only the, the infrastructure of the uh, national forest here and the local economy, but it was also uh, contributed to the, uh, the human resources, uh, the, uh, the conservation of the human resources that were, that were out there. Uh, these young men were pretty much hopeless and, and their families were destitute and it gave them some skills and hope to uh, recover their, the economic in, injury they had suffered uh, as a result of the, the Great Depression. It also, you know, provided them with skills and it's possible, especially during the, the later years, it also helped us to win World War II. Uh, these young men were used to camp life uh, running under the army, so when the, when the war finally came along, they were, um, they knew pretty much what to expect uh, in the army or navy, and um, I'm sure they were much better prepared to be soldiers and sailors fighting a war than they would have been if, if they hadn't participated in the uh, CCC. This particular camp is, is the best preserved out of about 4,500 camps, um, very few of which exist anymore. There are just a few buildings here and there uh, that survive. So we have a, a great treasure here that's worth preserving. The Forest Service uh, signed a memorandum of agreement um, after the site was listed on the National Register and agreed to uh, preserve four of the buildings out there. Uh, and that plan at that time was to remove the others as they became uh, significantly deteriorated. It did remove about half of the buildings that were uh, out there at the time. But as time has gone on, we've uh, realized the value of the place uh, in terms of its, its rarity and its significance to the country. Uh, and uh, we now are uh, much more willing to uh, provide resources to, uh, to restore the camp and possibly to put it back to use. Um, and uh, so we have restored a few more buildings and are in the process of doing that uh, and hopefully someday all of those buildings will be uh, restored back to their original condition. When Franklin Roosevelt took office in 1933 one of his first initiatives was to create the Civilian Conservation Corps. He took scores of men who were unemployed and moved them to camps on the public lands and used them to do all sorts of things. In just four months, an array of ambitious government programs was put into place. President Roosevelt's attack on the Depression began with his emergency conservation project, the purpose of which he clearly expressed when he said, this enterprise is an established part of our national policy. It will pay dividends to the present and future generations. The President's profound interest in this work prompted him to visit and personally inspect several of the conservation camps. This conservation army is rebuilding the forests, one of our most important and valuable natural resources. The New Deal workers helped the Forest Service develop on a much larger scale. In California, they cut a fire break of more than 600 miles through the Sierra Nevada. They restored totem poles in Alaska. They constructed Timberline Lodge on Oregon's Mount Hood. In the prairie states, they planted 2,000 miles of tree windbreaks on farms from Texas to Minnesota.
No, it was snow. It was the uh, night before last. <laughs> Hello everyone. Hello. My name is Mike. I want to thank you all for showing up, visiting the most well-preserved CCT camp in the nation. And I want to introduce a gentleman that's authored books, made DVDs and music CDs about the boys of the camp. So I want to introduce you and give a warm welcome to Bill Jamerson. Can you hear me out there in the back? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I have uh, I was telling Mary, she's done such a wonderful job here, Mary Nip, uh, over the years, that I've traveled all over the country. I've, I think I've been in about 10 states visiting uh, parks and reunions and so forth. And this is by far the, the finest example of a CCC restoration project I've had the privilege of being in. It really is a treasure. Um, some places you might have three or four buildings, but to have, you know, a couple dozen buildings, and they're still refurbishing them. You know, the ones that aren't finished, they're, they're raising funds for. So it's a great treasure, and it's a privilege to be here today, and I'm going to talk about why it's important and why they need to be preserved and why we need to promote this legacy and the story of the CCC. Flatten you up, your ma won't know you because you're all filled out. When you eat, no talking at the table. Cook's got a knife, he's a bit unstable. It's not gourmet, but three times a day. Eat all you want, you don't have to pay. If it ain't moving, I'm digging in. No telling where this food's been. If my stomach could talk, it would shout, Hallelujah! If you ask me to walk, I'm gonna come running right to ya. Cause it's chow time. I hear some stomachs growling out there. Someone want the you better hide those cookies, Mary. Thank you. Camp Rabidou is located on a 112-acre track, approximately five miles south of Black Duck. If you wish to visit, a host will provide tours from May through September. The education building and picnic site can be reserved for meetings or special tours by calling the Black Duck Ranger District. <laughs>